back again at last on the Nearbound podcast. Welcome, everybody. This is a very special episode. This was recorded live at the Nearbound Summit at the end of Sales Day. This is Jared Fuller, your host from this podcast, being interviewed by 30 Minutes to President's Club, the number one podcast in sales. Really, really amazing interview all about how salespeople can close more deals by working with partners, running those nearbound plays. This is a fast paced, high value interview. Dive in and hey, forward this to somebody at your team that works on sales, somebody at your company that works in sales, if I can get my English language right. And uh, have them check out 30 Minutes to President's Club and have them use this interview to, I don't know, maybe uh, give them the tools they need to hit their number this quarter. See you on the flip side. Always go to nearbound.com, subscribe, to get the Nearbound Daily and all our other stuff. Enjoy the episode. Session is, what are you talking about? Stop talking about your energy drinks, Nick. It's not energy drinks with Nick time. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this live episode of 30 Minutes to President's Club. My name is Armand Farouk, and I'm here with my co-host, Nick Sigelski. And today, it's the man of the hour, the man that's putting together this show, the one and only Jared Fuller. He is the CRO over at Reveal. Nick, why should people listen? So right now, if you are running only outbound, you are getting smacked in the face on a daily basis. And it's not very wise to sit around with your hands in your pockets waiting for inbound. And so today, we're going to be talking about actionable, practical, tactical ways that you can go implement all of these nearbound strategies. So if you've been wondering how you can start to tap into your ecosystem and partner networks and people that are near you to start and close and win more deals today, Jared's got some fun stuff in store for us. You heard it right here, folks. The one and only Nick will be able to do something moving forward other than sitting there waiting for inbound to come in. And a three, a two, a one. Let's ride. All right, Jared, welcome. You know we start every single episode with your top three actionable takeaways, so let's get your three. All right, so here's the first thing. Sales is about getting the answers to the test, right? We say things like, you know, in order to move these opportunities from stage one to stage two, we really need to do better discovery. And why do we assault our prospects with discovery? We assault them with it. Let me ask you 50 questions that you could have done the work to find out. So my first actionable takeaway is a nearbound sales play. I call the Intel play. And that's to go to the vendors. Let's say I'm at Drift, right? And another tech partner of mine is at Sixth Sense. It's to go to the vendors that have already closed that account and look at, hey, they became a new customer three months ago or they just renewed from year three. And to go to that AE, that CSM, that AM and get the answers to the test on the business challenges and business initiatives. Because let me tell you right now, guess what people don't list on their website or on their personal LinkedIn's? The business initiatives and the business challenges. So you can go shortcut that. That's my first tip is the Intel play. And that's going to folks that have already sold to the account that you're trying to sell to. Love it. What's number two, Jared? Well, this is the influence play. And again, these can be used across the entire life cycle of sales, right? So I've done this cold and I've done this stage four opportunity. The influence play, this is where it's like ninja level, you know, two, you know, whatever stripe or whatever. And this is about getting the influence of, let's say, a more executive decision maker. So let's say you're selling at the VP level and you have that first CMO level meeting. Well, I would do this at, let's say, when I was co-selling with Adobe, right? And I wanted to get that Adobe that they've had a 10-year relationship with that CMO. I have a zero-day relationship with that CMO. Might it be wise to have the account manager, when they have their QBR, that they sit down with that CMO, to have some slide about the value proposition between the two of us and give us that light nod and endorsement, getting them excited for the next call. So this is to put the play in front of the person that's going to have some influence up the chain. That's the influence play, tip number two. Woo, that is wise, and it would also be wise for us to move to tip number three. Round us out. All right, that's the intro play. So this is the Black Ops SWAT team level. This is the holy grail of what people think when they're talking partnerships. They think, I'm going to get these wonderful intros from these partners. Crickets, right? Where's the partner team? Where's my leads? You know, Nick's sitting back waiting for the warm inbound. He's also sitting back waiting for the warm intro from the partners. Here's what I'm saying to the 30 MPC in the nearbound audience. Invert that problem. Stop waiting for partners to come to you and you go to the partners. Here's what you do. Instead of just asking for a referral, qua referral, ask for a specific introduction to a specific person for a specific freaking reason. If you can write a personalized outbound cold email, then I promise you can write an email 
to someone that has a relationship that's crafted with the same level of thoughtfulness as a cold outbound email to get an introduction. And guess what? Uh, that's not just the highest performing lead channel. It's the highest performing lead channel by a factor of six. Woo! Look at that. The top three. All right, folks, so we got the three takeaways. We've got the Intel play, the influence play, the intro play. Of the three in the chat, put one, two, or three. Which one was your favorite? Question for you, Jared. You pick up an account. Let's start from the very beginning. I think you started with this Intel play. I could imagine scurrying around looking for every single possible detail about an account or every single possible in. What vendors they use, what investors they share in common, what common BD partners we have, who their next door neighbor is. That's more of a Nick kind of thing, but it's a little bit weird. So I pick up an account. What do I do to figure out my unique in on that account? So this is where... You've heard phrases in like the Salesforce ecosystem, like the 360 view of the customer. Well, there's actually something to it if you're selling into the mid to the enterprise, right? There's lots of vendors, right? There's lots of solutions consultants, agencies, other technology partners. And that 360 view of the customer, that just means who has a contractual relationship with the account I'm selling to, right? Mm -hmm. And then you want to look at the recency and the relevancy of that relationship. So if they just bought in the last quarter, I don't know about y'all, but is closing deals in this macroeconomic environment easier or harder than it was 12 months ago? It's harder right? Budget needs multiple stakeholder, you know, multi-threaded, you know, budget and approval right now today. That's just a fact. So who else has got through that process recently, right? So that's the recency and then relevancy. You might not have as strong a value proposition or relationship with that contact or partner. It doesn't have to be a formal partner. It could be, Hey, I had Scott Lee's presenting today. Scott's influenced a handful of deals for me, right? There's not like, he's not a formal partner type. He's a dude, right? And um, you map out those relationships on the recency and the relevancy. So recency is always great, you know, some compelling event. And then the relevancy could be, let's say, you know, a really tight integration or a multi-year solutions partner or service or agency, you know, relationship with that end account. Those would be the two vectors I look through. So Jared, I know you were over at Drift, I believe. And yep. let's try to make this really, really real for the audience. So if I'm picking up an account and I'm Drift and I'm trying to win my next Drift opportunity, what are some of the common threads that I can look for other than just brute force cold calling into this account that might get me a lower hanging fruit in on this account? Yeah, so let's use the Drift in um, Six Sense example. Whenever I left Drift, we were doing six, six deals a day where our reps were collaborating. You know, that's significant. Like this is not like a once in a blue moon type thing. The Slack channel that we had between the two groups were always on fire. So there's always a compelling event, right? You're not doing this on every account all the time. It's, hey, you're reaching out to this account for some reason. What's the context for why you're talking to this account, right? That should, if they're talking about ABM, for example, you're selling into, you know, the marketing department, you've had your first conversations and you realize, oh, ABM is essential to them. And then you see, oh, they bought six cents last quarter. Why would you not unpack that further and go get an Intel play or realize, hey, they actually had the CMO involved in this deal? There's an influence play, and then potentially you might earn the right for an intro play to get up the chain in the same account you're selling to. So those are the plays that we were running, right? I named these three eyes of nearbound sales, Intel, influence, intro, based on those tactical frontline, what actually worked to drive dollars in a partner type sale, a nearbound sale. So I'm curious, I'm sitting here, you're talking about this sort of end state. It's not end state, but you've talk, you're talking about a world where you've got a shared Slack channel, say that five times fast, between you and this other company that's selling to similar persona, that's helping affect similar problems. Gotcha. I'm sitting here thinking, well, that sounds like a really nice place to be. Jared, I sell exclusively to sales tech companies right now who want to advertise with 30 Minutes to President's Club. And we've got some really, really great sponsors. Um, how do I start to leverage those relationships? How do I start to leverage people near me? Like, what do I do to start? The first thing to start, here's the key. I call this the, I mean, this is a little bit of a mishmash of Chris Voss, right? When he calls out the black swan problem. And the black swan problem is when you got these multiple parties in this, there's this thing that's fundamentally true under the relationship that becomes discovered. So here's what you want to align to right out the gate. Yeah. If, uh, and this is what I did to go from $0 in revenue with Adobe and Marketo at Drift to $6 million, right? Zero to 6 million in that relationship in one year is you start with what is the fundamental like top three business initiative for that account? So let's say I'm Marketo. At the time, Marketo was what? They were uh, got taken private by Vista, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, so public and then private. So what was their most important revenue metric? One of the top three was net revenue retention. And the only way that they could book more was by getting more contacts into Marketo. Mm -hmm. Well, Marketo doesn't convert contacts. It shoots emails out, right? Drift, the chat bot comes in. We actually added more contacts to the database. Guess what CSMs were paid for? Net revenue retention, number of mm -hmm. contacts in the database, right? So guess what I could do? I didn't have to figure out all of the strategy in the world and, and partner pill the CEO of Adobe or the CEO of Marketo or get Jill Rowley, who's in the chat, right? Some of that story here. Here's what I did. I went to every single CSM at Marketo mm -hmm. and I said, here's how Sarah just closed a pretty cap sell by bringing me in. Can we talk? And then I sat down with them and I'm, this is not an exaggeration. I wrote with them 500, this is in Salesforce activity record, 500 introductions from Marketo CSMs to us. Sit down with them front line. Like, go talk to the people that are already doing business with your customer. Like, that's yeah. the reality. Talk with people who've already sold to the account. Yep. All right, so I want to go one level deeper here. Okay, so you said you went to every single CSM. Let's say yeah. Armand is one of these CSMs. And I'm looking on LinkedIn and I see Armand is a CSM at this company. Am I just like sending him a connection request saying, yo, I want to talk to you. Can we meet? Tell me how I'm actually getting a meeting with Armand and making it clear that this is worth his while because Armand's a busy dude. He won't even go out for drinks with me nowadays. Yeah. So how does this tie to the company's North Star, right? How is the CEO approved, right? I'm like, I know Marketo's North Star is net revenue retention. I have proof, right, of what we've done in specific accounts that's generated net revenue for Marketo and it's put money in a fellow CSM's pocketbook, right? So that email, that one, two, three, that's an email that you and I could both craft, Nick. Anyone in the audience can craft that email, but you got to have the answers, right? I said, answers to the test. You understand those three things. I shoot that note to Armand cold. I can do that. There's also another way to do it, which is the permission play, right? I, yeah. You've had plenty of episodes and things where you've talked about stuff like respect contracts, right? Mm -hmm. Sandler sales 101 stuff. The reality is you can get that permission from the partner play to be like, hey, how is this your relationship with this account? Is it good enough to have a conversation? right? Mm -hmm. That permission play, just sending Armand that, he'll, he'll probably tell me, Armand, you tell me whether or not that's, you know, hey, this is a, an account in great standing or like, oh, this account's on the rocks. Yeah. Right. And so you're using a combination of these plays that allow you to get more intel on the account, but then you're also using these plays to get introductions. So this is one way to actually build a lot of pipeline. Jared, I think you have some fun ways that you use this to multi-thread when a deal is live. So let's say, for example, that I know a couple of these CSMs, or let's say, for example, when I was working at PAVE, we knew people at insert HRIS company right here that had a shared set of companies, right, that we were all targeting together. And I would oftentimes use them in the mid-deal cycle as well. So I'm curious, what are the ways that you can influence a deal that is active using some of these partner channels? Okay, you see what's behind me. It's nearbound, right? Outbound is target, inbound is attract, nearbound is surround, right? Multi-threaded, multi-stakeholder, whatever you're thinking. The point is you're only as strong as the uh, gravity and the proximity of the relationship surrounding that account, right? So at any given point, what do we all do as reps? We get that wannabe champion and we feel mm -hmm. good about ourselves. They're telling us what we want to hear. We get the happy ears and we go, look, no, I got the direct relationship. I have a champion. Well, your champion's doing what when you're not there? Supposedly they're selling, right? Isn't that what we want them to do? Well, why not validate that? We do skip one, a skip level interviews. And it's like a CRO, right? You go past the manager, talk to the rep. Hey, what's actually happening here? Are you getting the coaching and support that you need? Oh, the manager's mm -hmm. screwing up, right? Do the same thing with your freaking champion. Test and inspect your champions, but don't do it in a way that's an affront to them or breaking their trust. Do it in a way where they're happy to validate that intro. Right. Yeah. If if you're known as a person that can be trustworthy to handle other relationships inside that account, the likelihood that you're going to win. This is enterprise sales at Adobe, at SAP, at Microsoft, at Salesforce. I can keep naming them, folks. The top reps there that are earning half a million plus a year, they're doing what I'm talking about. Right. I mean, I'm thinking about this and I'm realizing this is something that like we do at 30 Minutes to Presidents Club, Jared, where what will happen is I sell to marketers at sales tech companies. Right. Yes. And if I'm talking to a head of marketing and I have a good first conversation and we're going to meet two weeks later and we're going to go a little bit deeper in between that meeting, 
the play that I'm running is sort of this influence one that you're talking about where I'm saying, right. who do I know that can go put in a good word for me? And I'm looking at, okay, what sales reps listen to 30 Minutes to President's Club that I can say, hey, by the way, can you send a nice note to your VP of marketing? And I'm getting two or three people in that two-week period to ping them with a nice word. And you wouldn't believe perception is reality. I literally get like two people to say, oh, yeah, Nick and 30 MPC, they're pretty great. And then I'll get on the next meeting and it's like, Nick, I feel like everyone's talking about you. It's oh amazing. Oh, my God, I was just about to say that. Oh, it's crazy. Two people is apparently everybody. Right. So here's the thing, the recency and relevancy, right? That resonance. I have heard that more times in the past six months than I have ever before in my life because of these yep. nearbound plays where we're surrounding the account. And what people say is exactly what you said. Here's the outcome. That you, what's the goalpost that you're looking for? You want exactly what Nick said, folks, is you want to show up to a call and that person be like, you know, I feel like last month I never heard of nearbound before. And now that's all that I'm hearing. And I'm like, yeah, because I put three people that I know you trust a little birdie in their ear to go put a little birdie in your ear. I want to go in a little bit more on how you go about really convincing these people to do this for you, Jared. Because I know that there's the point around saying, hey, we have like this CSM who got this NRR and all of that stuff, right? But you're asking for like pretty high level introductions from a lot of these other CSMs. And so how are you managing your book of partners tactically do you have a big rolodex of all the csms over at six cents and you're staying on top of them you're throwing lunches you're throwing dinners are you meeting with these people one-on-one -on -one every so often because i imagine if i'm just asking for this stuff over cold email or over linkedin it's going to get really hard for someone to advocate for me to do this big surround motion. There's three things I'm gonna unpack for you real quick. The first thing is you don't necessarily have to go cold to that CSM or AM or account executive. If you do have a partner manager on your team, that's the whole point. Hey, here's my list of hundred accounts, which 10, 15, 20 should I have relationships with our top ISVs or our top agencies, right? So build that nearbound account list and then have your partner manager go do some freaking work for you. You know, if yep. you're in partnerships right here today, this is these are the plays that you should be doing is getting the permission for Armand to connect with that CSM over at Six Sense, right? That, that's a no brainer, you know, connection. Right. You can track that in Salesforce. Hey, partner person, check mark. You did something right. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Um, the next thing I'm going to unpack for you is that in that play, um, what you're doing tactically with that individual is that you're not just taking them and, um, you know, sending them the cold email and asking for X, Y, or Z you're bringing this specifically context. What, what do I mean by context? I mean that stop making it hard for people to help you. Mm -hmm. Stop. Right. So for instance, if you're asking for an introduction, might it benefit you to think about like the work that you're asking the person to do is that I have to try and unpack your world and then write a personal email with my social capital on the line to yeah. someone that you don't know. Wait, wait a second. Like that's a lot of mental gymnastics. And the first time I asked a high stakes, you know, billion dollar CEO to make an intro, all that he said back to me was write it for me. And I've never forgot that. I was like, oh, well, well, that's what the CEO of a billion dollar company wants. Write it for me. Yes. Freaking write it for him. Be helpable. Make yourself the most helpable person on the planet is my clarion call to that point. Can you talk to me about what that ghost written yes. note sounds like? Yeah, absolutely. So here's the thing is that like uh, Jill Rowley's in the chat. She was going to be one that was on the show. So like I'm trying to bring as much heat as I can, but she taught me something very important. Her and Sam McKenna have this phrase, show me, you know me, right? Mm -hmm. And that applies to the person you're asking to do the intro for, right, as well. Go take a look at the past couple of their LinkedIn posts, right? If you're, you know, uh, savvy and you want to use GPT, throw their last four or five LinkedIn posts into GPT or emails that they've sent or blog posts or whatever, and then say, hey, write an introduction with X, Y, Z context from this person to this person. Guess what? It fits out a nice little tiny template. You can even use my Nearbound Sales Blueprint intro template um, mm -hmm. as an example. And it's not that hard to write. So what you want to do, again, match their tone of voice, right? How they tend to write or speak, and then make it as short and sweet as possible. All right. So let's say I'm trying to get an introduction to Nick, right? Dangerous decision, right? <laughs> and let's say that, Jared, you're the sales rep in this case, and you are trying to get a referral from me to Nick. You know that we're co-hosts together. Give me a sense of like what that might actually sound like. And you can use any product in the world, any service in the world, whatever makes the most sense. But let's make this really, really real for the audience. What would you tell me to convince me that this was a good use of time for Nick's calendar? 
All right. So like Nick, um, let's imagine uh, I'm trying to raise some capital for uh, the new uh, bicycle company. I see you got a bike in the background. So I'm, I'm carrying out my Harry Mac here and calling out stuff in the back. Um, you got a bicycle in the background and I'm trying to raise uh, some money for some app that has, uh, I don't know, it has something to do with, let's say, tracking your you know, cardiovascular health. And I know Armand is your uh, you know, host on 30 MPC. Here's what I might do. I might go, hey, the reason why I'm reaching out to Nick and trying to get his uh, X, Y, or Z is I know how much of an avid cycler he is, right? I saw his Instagram post about X or Y. And then here's my Z value hypothesis. I don't know if you've heard that phrase before, value hypothesis, value hypothesis. Yes. Armand, um, I wanted to write an intro email for you to Nick about this. Am I on the mark? Would that be worth me writing? And if so, would you send it? Right. So it's like the permission, it's the context. I made it yeah. as easy. All you have to respond with Armand is yes. That's such a great respond. play because what you're doing is you're looking at the, there's sort of like three elements going in there. You're like figuring out the piece about me. You're figuring out like the value prop you're going to pitch and the hunch as to why I'm, I would be interested. And instead of you like writing this really detailed note right away, you're saying, Hey, here's the components that I'm going to yes. feed into this note. Before I go write this thing and ship you something that you're like, whoa, 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 Nick actually quit biking and he keeps it in his background because he oh. doesn't have a big apartment. He has nowhere else to store it. Um, don't send that. Like you're actually getting their validation first and you're showing you did this prep. And it's almost like a double deposit because then when they get the real email, they're like, oh, this is good. Yeah. I mean, whenever you get known, like, so this is the thing I've seen about Rowley. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do some of this bringing her in is that. She's the most helpful person on the planet. Her ability to communicate in SMS style, yeah. right? Make context and then get an ask back and forth. So like, that's the other thing too, is you have to remember whenever you're doing influence or intros or Intel yeah. from other people, communicate as if you're in an iMessage window, right? Mm -hmm. Like be like, hey, uh, X about Nick's bike, Y about, you know, this thing, Z about this. Um, could I write an intro for you? Right. Like think, think simply and how executives make, make it easy for people to help you. So that's what I mean by that. Jared, I'm curious, going back to some of this other stuff that happens in the mid deal cycle. Yes. How do you balance the trade off between I'm going to try to get my champion to do this near balance around type of motion for me versus okay, I, I don't want to use my champion for this. And I'm going to use a separate referral channel to keep a separate line of communication. Because I could see on one hand, it's nice to have your champion empowered there. But at the same time, you're also like putting all of your eggs in the champion basket if you're only getting introductions from them. Yeah, I, a absolutely. I think this is where we would come back to, you know, level setting and talking about the plays that you're running. I feel like the best sales processes I've ever been a part of. And I was talking with Bobby Napletonia this morning about how they were doing big, giant, you know, seven figure deals at Salesforce, right? Closing these in complicated scenarios. And how he goes about doing something like this is he'll make it extremely transparent about the process that they're about to run, right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, whenever I'm working inside of an account, like I'm actually saying, you know, hey, and I'm going to have such and such reach out to your CRO. Mm. Right? Tell them. Why you're like, absolutely tell them because there's one of two things that can happen, right? They'll say, okay, right? And they're totally chill with it or they'll object. Well, guess what? In sales, we don't sell to good news. We sell to bad news. Objections is where selling happens, right? If you, here's like, here's the reality. If you're not running these plays, you're leaving an entire arena of objections unknown to you. Yeah. Right. Just by asking that. And if they're cool with it, then, you know, okay, I actually really do have my champion. I said, remember to test your champions. That's a perfect way to test your yeah. champion, but also help your champion is to get other people to reach out to those contacts, not just them. That's right. Is you're getting behind this multi-threading motion. And oftentimes one of the things that you can do to take something off your champion's plate is you can change the voice. So for example, Nick and I will actually do this all the time when we're selling sponsorships together, where Nick will be working with a champion and I pretend like I know how to sell, but Nick is the one who actually sells all of our sponsorships. And sometimes he'll be like, I'm working with this awesome director of demand gen. I can tell maybe they're not talking to the content team as much, or maybe the CMO is new and we don't have a great relationship with them. Armand, would you send a one-to-one -one note 
to the CMO. And so that's one way that if we had a referral channel, it's even more powerful. And what happens is both Nick and I will be looking for who do we both know that knows the CMO that can make an introduction for us without ruining or sort of souring the relationship that we have with our champion. That's one. The other thing that I think is really, really impactful about this, Jared, is to your point around uh, selling is uh, you're selling when you're handling objections and whatnot. Oftentimes I find that these that folks will use these nearbound plays either at the beginning or way too late in the sales cycle. And I actually think one of the most impactful places you can use this type of play is think of it if you were ever playing Mario Kart as a kid. At the beginning of the race, you want to get as many booster pads as humanly possible to break away from the fray. Nick knows this because he loves playing Mario Kart. And so when things are going well early on in your sales cycle, you want to be peppering your champion with these nearbound referrals and this positive market signal because that's going to tell them this is a deal that's worth multi-threading. It's going to add juice early on in your sales cycle. It's going to add things it's going to accelerate your deal when things are going well as opposed to trying to save it when things aren't going well or when you're being blocked well what's happening here too is you are teaching them you said oh it's worth multi-threading it's worth them throwing their resources and their time and effort and attention towards meeting with you if i'm trying right. to sell to a marketing organization and i'm just talking to a director of demand gen who's uh, yeah, this could be interesting. Yeah, I'll meet with Nick once a month. Well, budget, I'll budget speak out soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I'm meeting with head of content, head of demand gen, the marketing ops team, and I'm meeting with three or four people because they've been validated or we've been validated by these folks in their network, they take me more seriously and they invest more in me and teaching me about what they are trying to solve. Yes. Why do they take you more seriously, Nick? They take you more seriously because it shows that you actually care about their company writ proper, right? Yeah. The more context that you have about your, the customer surround, then all of a sudden your conversations get better. You're actually seen as like, hey, Nick's on my team. Look at all the team members he's talking to, right? When you're siloed and single-threaded, you don't have those same dynamics. You're not talking as intelligently. You're not able to talk about how, you know, I'm in a sales cycle right now. I think I was telling Armand about this, where I am, here's where I'm multi-threaded with, COO, CEO, CRO, CMO, COO, and CPO, right? I have six C-suite involved in a deal. And everyone, every single one of those, each department is involved, right? And I'm trying to put this together to teach, to actually do, to show, here's how you go do a transformational sale, is that you do need that level of buy-in. You think you're going to you get could that, do that? You have to do it at the C-suite, right? You could do that across the marketing department, just like you said. What uh, what stage of your forecast is that in? Is that best or worst? That's a Q4 commit, commit baby. Oh, there you go. I love it. Man, that's a commit right there. Well, folks, if you do a lot of this, you're going to be having a lot more commits. And uh, Jared, sadly, we're running out of time and we got to move ourselves to the final question. And so the final question for you is this. We've talked about a lot of really great things that salespeople, sales teams should be doing. Now I got to ask you about a shouldn't. And so my last question for you is, what is one bad habit that you see a lot of folks exhibiting related to this that you think they need to break because it hurts them more than it helps? So giving up on this process because you're not getting results. So here's what here's what I see happen is that bad actor Bob. Bad actor Bob somewhere else in your poor little sales life had ruined this channel for you forever, right? It's like there was this partner person that promised you the world and then that partner destroyed your deal, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the past is not an accurate indicator of the future. So if you've had been if you've been burned by that in the past, shake that off. And you need to come into this as a curious learning machine. Everything is changing in B2B sales and tech right now. Everything is. I'm not saying throw away outbound. I'm saying layering on these plays should be an act in curiosity, right? And as you get more cur curious about these, oh, that worked. That didn't work. You're going to get a little bit more courage. You're going to be willing to actually write the template in the email. And then you're going to have conviction. And guess what? When you have conviction about this process, you end up being like, the most effective salesperson in your organization, you're going to end up in President's Club and you'll have relationships that follow you for 20 years. That's the yes. other thing. You get known as a person that does business, that doesn't just sell. Oh, I love it. It's amazing. I mean, it is amazing. I see these salespeople spend 45 minutes staring at their computer screen utterly deeply with like obsessive attention, personalizing an email to a human being that will not even open that email. And probably might, like, I've seen people do that for folks that aren't at the company anymore. And I'm like, 
oh, you're right. When you flip this and you focus that same intention and effort at the folks who are actually going to see your message, holy smokes, things go well. Absolutely. Jared, phenomenal episode. We got to move to our 60 second recap coming up now. Armand, you want to give me your first two? Your top four takeaways from this episode with Gerald Fulch. Which is, there's an edit. That's why we have an edited show, folks. Your top four takeaways from this episode with Jared Fuller include number one, that template. The best thing that you can do is you can tell someone why you want an introduction to Nick. The fact that you know that he loves bikes, but not give them the blurb right away. Ask for permission to make an introduction. That's number one. Nick, what's number two? Number two is this is an end state that you want to get to. If you can get to a place where you have a shared Slack channel with the folks that you're running these plays with because you're helping them and they're helping you, you're going to be able to move really, really fast and not have to like try to sort through the LinkedIn inbox or jam up in email. What's number three, Armand? Number three, a simple alphabetical framework that I'm going to give you. And Jared, the last one's coming to you. A- B and C. If I'm A, the referrer is B, and Nick is the referral C, I need to get two things to match up. I need to figure out what B is incentivized on. The example that Jared gave is figure out how you boost NRR for that CSM. And then I need to get that to line up with C, the problem that Nick wants to solve. If I can get those two things to match up, I've got an ongoing, never-ending referral chain. And lastly, number four, Jared, do you want to I'll take it from here. Be the most helpable person in the room and someone that people love helping. And that means that you're bringing them the totality of your research, your context, and everything that you have in the most simple form possible. And I'll give you one final example of one time that I closed a $6 million deal on where I sent the executive VP that reported directly to the CEO. I sent him eight emails in a row, eight months in a row, that all it gave them was context. I said, hey, here's what's happening in the account. I'm not asking for a meeting. Hey, here's what's happening in the account. I'm not asking for a meeting. I did that eight times. And by the time we got to that eight month, right, in an actual $6 million deal, guess what happened? I was very, very, very easy to help to get that signature across in procurement. Boom. Amazing show, Jared. Nick, how can people help us out here? All right. So if you liked the way that Armand and I interviewed Jared, we actually do this sort of for a living where we got to interview the smartest, best folks in GTM. And Jared, you're in that pool, my friend. This is elite, the best of the best. Uh, we do this a lot. If you want to check out 30 Minutes to President's Club, our whole premise is we only talk about things people can do, say, or write that very day to make a difference in closing deals, driving business. Jared, this was phenomenal. You are one brilliant mind. Thank you, my friend. Thank you all. 